Welcome to part 2 of my Sega Genesis vs Sega 32X series. In part 1 we looked at 7 games that the two platforms shared, breaking down some of the visual and audio differences, and seeing if the 32X really did add any real value to games you could already get on the standard Genesis. In this episode we will go over 7 more games that were shared between the two consoles, as well as an additional bonus game I compared just for the fun of it. Will the 32X come through with some killer upgrades, or will developers disappoint us with minor changes that really don't add a whole lot for all that extra money? Keep on watching and find out. Virtua Racing shares a unique similarity between the two versions. The Genesis needed extra hardware to run both of them. The original Virtua Racing for the Genesis used the SVP, or Sega Virtua Processor, a booster chip inside the cartridge that helped render the polygons faster than the Genesis ever could alone. And of course Virtua Racing Deluxe uses the 32X itself to render the polygons you see. And the differences between the two methods is quite stark. While the original Genesis release was impressive in its own right, the 32X is the better version of the two by leaps and bounds. You get much better color across both the backgrounds and polygons. Rendering performance is vastly superior as well. The 32X's sound hardware gets some use with clearer voices, sound effects, and music. The devs also gave the 32X version quite a bit of extra content in the form of two new tracks and two new cars. Both games also have a two-player split-screen mode where once again, the 32X version really puts the SVP-powered cartridge to shame. I captured these two games back-to-back, -back, playing the 32X version first and then the Genesis. The contrast in the visuals made playing the latter extremely difficult. Everything looks and runs so much worse, it actually makes some of the areas of the track hard to see. Of course, neither of these games are a match for the Model 1 Arcade, but having a choice between home versions at the time, it was 32X all the way. I do prefer the AI in the Genesis version as far as gameplay is concerned. It's much more fair in regards to difficulty. On the 32X, the top two cars drive a perfect line every race, and you need to be just as dead on accurate to even get close to their level. Casual fans will never see a first place win in that version of the game. Since Sega made the 32X, you'd think that they'd make software that really took advantage of it. I mean, they were trying to sell the thing to you, right? Well, in 1996, we received World Series Baseball starring Dion Sanders for the 32X, a continuation of the much-loved baseball series that started on the Sega Genesis. But just look at the two games side by side. You get a bit more color in the players in the field and that super next-gen feature of scaling when a play warrants the excitement. And that's it, man. That's what your $160 add-on and $60 cartridge got you. The majority of the sound effects are similar, the voices are almost identical, and the front end and option screens are exactly the same. In fact, these two versions are much more the same than they are different. They're both 24 megabits, they both have battery backups, and they both feature multiplayer. The 32X version only saw release in the US and that wasn't until February of 1996, well after the demise of the hardware itself. Rarely can you use the term cash grab for a failed product, but Sega phoned in this lazy port, making it one of the worst defenders of the practice for the platform. If you like baseball games, you are missing very little by sticking with the Genesis original. Next up, for the grade, the second baseman, number 20. Out! 
now batting for the Braves, the first baseman. I was a big wrestling fan in my youth. Hell, some of my favorite games back then were wrestling titles. I loved WWF Raw on the Genesis, so when it was announced for the 32X, I was excited to give it a go. Pitting the two side by side, there is very little reason for celebration, however. Outside of some color differences, the two remain quite similar in animation, sprite size, and arena design. They both are four player and retain the same match types as well. The biggest differences you'll find is actually in the music. The 32X has much better music and each wrestler's theme song sounds much fuller and richer. Crowd noises are better and every wrestler's grunts and groans are clearer. But for that sound trade-off, you get another game that runs at 30 frames per second versus the 60 of the Genesis original. Some of you won't mind this, but if you are sensitive to the lower performance, it can impact replayability severely. To make matters worse, this was another game that came at a premium at the time, costing $70 when the Genesis and Super Nintendo versions were already being discounted. The core game here has always been fun, particularly that Royal Rumble mode where you could battle your friends, but at half the performance plus additional cost, this was one you could live without. While Acclaim was responsible for publishing both WWF Raw and WWF WrestleMania the arcade game, the results couldn't have been any different. Here Sculptured Software really upgraded the standard Genesis version. The sprites are larger and more colorful, the ring and arena are more detailed, and the music is in a different league entirely. It does again suffer from the 30 frames per second performance issue, but in this case it's worth it to get the increase in the other areas. I always thought the original Genesis game was impressive in its own right. It had all the wrestlers and looked fantastic for hardware that was years behind the arcade machine in terms of technical advantages. With that said, I really do like the 32X entry as well. They really kicked up the visual oomph, and I noticed very little slowdown when more than two wrestlers were on the screen. Had WWF Raw had this same level of enhancement, it would have been a far more impressive experience. You don't often hear me say this, but I'll take the 32X's visual goodies over the smoother gameplay of the Genesis edition in this one. The Brutal Fighting Game series was released on the Genesis and Sega CD in 1994 under the name Brutal Paws of Fury. These two versions were largely the same visually, with the CD having the added benefit of better music. When the 32X edition was released the following year, it was called Brutal Unleashed Above the Claw, and saw some pretty radical upgrades in background graphics and content. You get two new fighters and four new stages, giving you plenty of things to learn and play around with. The backgrounds have seen some major polish, both in color and detail. The ones that were redrawn are night and day, and really take advantage of the 32X's additional palette. So, more fighters, more stages, and improved visuals. It's another 32X winner, right? Nope, sure as hell ain't. 
While the additions are welcome, this takes a nosedive in the gameplay department. Running at 30 frames per second, it's so much choppier than the Genesis and Sega CD versions. Stages that have foreground details show it off the worst, damn near a slideshow of poor scrolling. I was never a fan of Brutal's gameplay either, so losing that smoothness just worsened my distaste for it. The setup was always weird anyway. You start out with no special moves and have to earn them as you play. And get this, to keep what you have learned, you gotta put in a password to recover them. I don't know man, this game was an acquired taste to begin with, so the 32x version is a hard sell. I can tolerate 30 frames per second in a brawler like Wrestlemania, but here you really do feel it impact the gameplay that wasn't all that great to begin with. I included RBI Baseball here so you could see where the series was headed in terms of design and gameplay. RBI Baseball 94 was actually the last game in the series for the Sega Genesis, and RBI Baseball 95 was only released for the 32X. The new batter box view looks much better than the original Genesis design. The infield and outfield are actually proportional to one another's actual stadium, something the Genesis version was way, way off on. The outfield was always overly massive in the 16-bit game, making it really easy to get hits and score runs thanks to the really large gaps between players. The 32X remedied this, making it a much more realistic simulation of the sport. The only thing I'd criticize here is that it still didn't look like a 32-bit sports title. I mean, they could have done a polygonal field and stadium for a grander effect to the presentation. Instead, it's all two-dimensional, small, and lacking details that you'd see in premium 32-bit releases. This one plays well enough and is a solid upgrade over the previous Genesis release, but you compare it to something like World Series Baseball on the Saturn, and it just gets blown out of the water. Third. At the end of 1995, Electronic Arts released FIFA 96 for both the 32X and Genesis. This is one of the few titles that actually had two different teams develop two different games under the same name for the Genesis and 32X. They were even released on the same day, though the latter was only released in Europe. And boy, what a difference between the two versions you get. While the Genesis uses traditional sprites against a 2D field, the 32X version uses 3D polygons for the field and stadium, and 2D sprites that scale in and out with the action. This allows you to choose different camera angles that can really change the way it feels and plays. This definitely gives the 32X version a next generation appeal the 16-bit game lacks entirely. But to be fair, there are some trade-offs for this new 3D engine. First, you lose the beautiful animation in the Genesis sprites and the smooth field movement. While the 32X visuals are more dynamic and exciting, they are also far choppier and nowhere near as detailed. As much as that disappoints me, I still have to say I was impressed that it exists at all. Most sports games, even Sega's own line, were just rebadged Genesis ports and little else. Electronic Arts actually gave you a 3D engine here, and that was no small victory on a platform with so few games.
The last comparison I have for you I'm including as a bonus only. You can't really compare these two because they were completely different games to begin with. They were also many, many years apart. I'm throwing it in to show you just what could have been done with the 32X in regards to software sprite scaling. You saw Afterburner complete in the first episode, so coupled with this, I hope you can see why it was such a missed opportunity for Sega to shun these types of games. OutRun was supposedly in development for the 32X at one point, but Sega cancelled the project before it was finished. I think with the added features of the 32X, this is the route Sega should have gone. OutRunners, AB Cop, Rail Chase, Slipstream, the 32X could have been Sega's place for super scalers, giving Genesis owners access to a huge amount of software that was virtually untapped in the American home market. Even if these games had to be cut back to 30 frames per second, they still would have ran and played well, particularly against the previous home efforts. The base Genesis had a few games that showed off software sprite scaling fairly well itself, but I think between Space Harrier and Afterburner, the 32X showed it was more than competent at doing strong ports for these types of games. That ends part 2 and I think we can again reach the conclusion that a lot of this software were just Genesis games with slight modifications in color and sound. Sometimes the two were so close, you'd need to be told which one was actually supposed to be the 32-bit version. But like our first batch, you also get to see a few instances where the old 32X was up to the task of creating a great game given the right circumstances. Often when a game was developed from the ground up on the platform, it tended to do a much better job impressing us. This was almost always true when it was doing something the base Genesis wasn't particularly good at, like heavy sprite scaling or rendering polygons. Of course the Achilles heel of the 32X continued to be its two-dimensional performance. When a game relied on it to render the majority of the image, we got big hits to how it ran. Some games were able to weather this better than others, but it was definitely noticeable either way. This begs the question why Sega left such a glaring design fault in there, knowing it would limit what the add-on was actually capable of. The fact that it needed the Genesis to smoothly scroll a 2D game engine was an automatic black mark against any original content. After spending all this time with these games back to back, I'm starting to think Sega's failure with the 32X was less about the timing and price of the unit and more about its execution. This thing was definitely not developer friendly, tying their hands creatively and making it a chore to deal with on the most basic level. Sega had a real problem understanding that ease of use for third parties was half the battle, something Sony would capitalize on the very same year. In part 3, we will move on to the games that appeared on both the Sega CD and 32X, as well as a few games that were similar in content. Did the trifecta of all three machines finally give us the boost we were looking for, or were we once again left with disappointments? Tune in next time to find out. I'm SegaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.